Okay, this is my episode recap for Alone Australia episode one. I saw it two nights ago at a premiere event in Sydney. It was just chained to a select bunch of media people to get the buzz going and it's gonna air next week in Australia. So, initial impressions uh, was basically wow. I'll leave that up to you. you the emotions that you feel uh, are totally up to you, but I, I really felt like um, I, was, I was impressed by the way they put it together, by the awesome participants that they chose. I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about <laughs> the other nine people. They're really authentic people, every one of them. And uh, I, I could relate to the stress that they felt getting out there and you know, their honesty, the humor of it was great. And that is Australia, you know, the way, <laughs> the way those guys are talking, that's Australia. That's how we talk. And uh, it's not a put on, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that people are gonna see Australia in a way that they haven't really seen it before because this isn't really reality TV. It's more like reality. So it's not like reality TV. So it's, it's good, it's gonna be good. Um, yeah, in such a diverse range as well. All right, I'm going to speak mostly about things behind the scenes or just fill in blanks that you might not know about Australia or some of the bush tucker or some of the situations that, that we're in. And obviously, I've got to be very careful not to give anything away um, about what might happen next because I don't know how they've put the thing together as well. So I don't know. So <clears throat> obviously, Tassie, it's cold, wet and windy. I'm just going to fill you in overall. The um, It's West Coast. Tasmania and it's inland so it's not on the not on the beach before going down there uh, I, I thought it would probably be in Tasmania that, that was my guess although I did do um, you know recce's in Victoria um, New South Wales and Tasmania but yeah it's cold and wet so the latitude there is about probably 42 so it was mid-winter we were put in before the winter solstice so the days are quite short and Whilst it's not freezing by, well, it was freezing, but whilst it's not super cold by North American standards, it's cold by Australian standards. Now, it's kept a little bit warmer because there's always a, a, a westerly airstream, basically, that comes from the Southern Ocean. And whilst that water's not really warm, it still, it kind of mediates the temperature down there. So it doesn't get really extreme like an equivalent latitude in North America, where you've got more land mass and therefore less heat coming off the ocean. But still chilly, um, snow on the mountains, frost on the ground, cold water, and a lot of rain. So I think it's, well, I can't remember the figures, but pretty much nine out of 10 days or more is, um, is a rainy day down there. Like sunshine is, is rare, it can be very fleeting, it comes over. And, and generally you just got clouds streaming over from the west and it's like rain, 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 stop for a bit, rain. So that's part of your planning process. So, uh, I'll just do my best going from memory here. So, uh, uh, so Chris, uh, an army, ex-army guy, so am I. So Chris and I straight away have that bond. Um, he was in the Iraq war. Um, I'm not sure fully of his Middle Eastern operations background, but that's part of him. The way he speaks, that's army culture uh, coming out. There's, a, there's, there's bravado in there, but it's all based on um, putting up with stuff. And um, one of the ways you put up with stuff is to turn it into humor and laugh at it. And he's got that in spades. That's, he's, a, he's like a, a good representative, I reckon, of the Australian army, the kind of guy you're gonna meet. Uh, so yeah, it's great, great seeing him. He's just like a no BS kind of guy. And I was struck by the amount of swearing actually. And this is a, the, the, the channel um, SBS, the network, is is a different kind of network. It's not a big commercial network. Uh, it's it's designed for diversity, and uh, it also allows content to be more raw and real than it normally is on standard commercial TV. And I, I reckon that's a good thing because survival brings out emotions, and it takes away the emotion when there's a beep on it. You know, and I think, and this is totally personal, right? that a bit of swearing here and there is appropriate because it relieves tension. If you're communicating to other people, it lets them know, wow, this person's serious. Now, if you swear your head off all the time <laughs> and coming from the army, that's a common thing, right? It loses its um, its importance. So everyone's swearing all the time and it doesn't mean anything. But if you 
If you just occasionally swear, it lets people know that, wow, you actually, this means something to you. Okay, so that's why there's a lot of swearing going on. It's not because we're all potty mouths. Uh, you know, some of us probably are, but you do a lot more swearing out there than you would in normal life because it's more extreme than normal life. Now that's not for everyone. Some people um, have different views and they don't swear at all and good on them. But it, it reveals a little bit about your psyche and some of the ways that you cope and some of the ways that you communicate. So um, yeah, Chris out there, muddy as. You can see, you can see him sinking up to his um, top of his boots there in the mud. It's just really wet there. It's a, it's a rainforest, it's pouring all the time. Um, there's very little evaporation. So it's hard to find dry wood. And I would say, I mean, I've been to, um, to Vancouver Island in, in Canada. It's, it's, it, you can see it looks similar to Vancouver Island um, or that Alaskan Panhandle stuff. And there are many similarities to that. I mean, the latitude is probably even similar to that, um, maybe a little bit closer to the equator. But yeah, it fires hard to, it's hard to get dry wood. And um, Beck, I love Beck, she's just so, she's so real. And, and she's hearing those things crashing around. That was a legitimate risk. Um, the, the falling over of trees and limbs dropping. Now, I think often that risk is blown up. You know, you go to scouts or something like that. And it's like, oh yeah, a tree's gonna fall on you. Most of the time, I'm not stressed about that in the, in the Australian bush. But out there, I, it was, there was stuff crashing down a lot. Um, every day you'd hear a, uh, of, of something crashing. So that's a legitimate risk. And you're looking around you and there's all these dead and rotting trees and you're like, which one's gonna fall next? And it's, it's, there's no very little open areas. I mean, if you went and put yourself down on the, on the, the grassy areas, then the lake could come up and you'd have to move camp. So you, there's very, it's difficult to um, mitigate the risk of deadfall. So yeah, it's a legitimate risk that it can keep you up at night wondering if something's gonna happen, particularly when those big gusts of winds come up. And there's a lot of gusts of winds coming up there. Uh, I love that fire starter uh, scene where, I mean, everyone knows, even if you're not a bush person and if you've watched the American series of Alone, you'll know how, how critical it is to lose your fire rod. And I think there's been two people so far in the American series. It's critical not to lose it. And I felt the same um, level of concern about losing mine and uh, it was so funny just to watch Beck going through those things she articulated the concern better than I was able to <laughs> um, but everywhere you put it down like if I put it down there and, the, and the, the fire burns across it could destroy it or you know even dropping it on a rock it can shatter but worst of all is just losing it so that was so funny watching that um, Rob um, Rob's cultural background it i'm so glad rob is on there and um in his perspective and the emotion that he felt when he was um introducing himself to country is uh, is a really important thing and that's something about the show which i really um admire is that there is i reckon a lot of tokenism in in australia about how we respect aboriginal people and there's this like spiel about you know respecting Aboriginal elders, you know past, present, future, you know brah, brah, no one cares. It's just get it, get the formality out of the way. It wasn't like that for a loan. They they genuinely cared and they genuinely consulted um, better than any other organisation. So that was really really good. Um, so I I'm glad that that is coming out. Australia needs to get used to that. I think New Zealand does a much better job of respecting Maori culture than Australia does. And if you look at uh, uh, I've done a lot of work with the New Zealand military and Air Force. And it, Maori culture is just part of their way of life. They have the customs, they, they name their squadrons after stuff. We do that a little bit in, in Australia, but they, it's just more part of their culture there. It's, um, so I think we can learn a lot from New Zealand and, and the way that they do that compared to the way we do it. Uh, so yeah, that was, I really enjoy, not, enjoy is not the right word, I'm just glad that's in there and I certainly feel that connection I'm not an Aboriginal person but I, I feel the same no I don't feel the same connection to country I feel a strong connection to country it's hard to compare it to theirs theirs is stronger basically but I still have a strong one because I evolved in the bush like everybody else in on planet earth and some of us feel it stronger than others but uh, yeah it's an important aspect and and we can we can learn to see how Aboriginal people see the bush 
um, by watching Aboriginal people in the bush. All right, uh, who else was on there? Uh, Gina, yeah. How good is Gina's possum skin coat? I love it. It's <laughs> she spent a lot of time making it. I've actually made my own possum skin rug, and they're not actually that warm. They look awesome, and they are awesome, but they're not that warm. Um, oh, they they are warm, but compared to like a down sleeping bag or something, they're not that warm. And as it said in the show, she didn't bring a sleeping bag. Now, that my immediate thought, if I didn't know Gina, would be that was a dumb decision. But Gina's someone that understands the bush well and she would have had that would have been a very very considered decision for her and i'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out um i wouldn't i wouldn't underestimate that decision uh, and, and that freed up another item for her and i don't know what that other item was yet but you know maybe that other item is you know a game changer so yeah but it was it would, uh, it would have been difficult out there without a sleeping bag but that that is a hell of a possum skin rug and that would have mitigated it but they aren't still fully like a, a down or a minus 10 sleeping bag by any stretch of the imagination and when possum skin gets wet it stays wet like it's just like a wet blanket um, the fur is kind of good but it just takes yonks for it to, to dry out because i was using one up the great back up the great barrier reef on my last expedition and i was like man this felt so warm in my living room but when i'm out here freezing it this thing feels like it's got no warmth in it Uh, everyone's got such different sights and I'm only seeing them for the first time and there really is a lot of struggle there's a lot of dead wood in the water and that has a lot of effects which I'm sure um, you know everyone experiences and the mud the, the steepness of the terrain it's quite quite a variation in sights uh, and it's just there's a lot of luck of the draw there and it and it literally was a draw so it was it was done randomly so everyone's got their own little demons that they got to fight um speaking of demons um or devils probably more likely when beck was talking about tassie devils and how she's worried they're going to rip her face off i think there there are stories of that happening and whilst tasmanian devils are mostly scavenging animals they 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 can also take um, live animals as well and, and there's been stories of people being ripped apart by tassie devils you know so it's the kind of thing that <laughs> it can keep you up at night <laughs> and so i'm actually just going to show you some footage um what um this is from a place called aussie ark and um i just got to fill you in on the backstory about tassie devils so there's a facial cancer that developed about oh, i might be wrong in this fact but about 10 to 20 years ago it's a contagious facial cancer. It's very unusual for a cancer to be contagious. But these animals have these large ranges where they're covering like seven kilometers a night and they're, they're coming across carcasses and they're ripping them up and their no noses are brushing and they, that cancer transfers from that animal to the next animal. And uh, so there's, there's very few Tasmanian devils in Tasmania that don't have the facial cancer. So a guy called Tim Faulkner, who's a pretty big name guy, kind of, He's, I would say he's like the, the next Steve Irwin kind of guy. Um, he even wears the khaki clothes and stuff, but a slightly different shade. Anyway, he, he basically um, started a project where he, he gathered a bunch of clean ones, or ones that weren't infected with the cancer, and he moved them up close to where I live in um, sort of mid-New South Wales, high up at a similar altitude. So a similar landscape to uh, Tasmania. And he's breeding them up because the Tasmanian population, I think, has decreased about 90% or something horrendous. So they are on their path to extinction down there. When that happens, the plan is to, when they're all dead and they're confirmed that they're all dead, that said so the, 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 the cancer and disease has died with them, they'll bring the Tassie Devils down from Aussie Ark, as it's called. Uh, I'll put a link in the description. It's a volunteer organisation. Um, and they'll, they'll bring the Aussie Ark uh, Tassie Devils down to Tasmania and release them again. It's a it's a big picture thinking project and um, you know a good one. So yeah, they're 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 amazing little animals, Tassie Devils, and they they scream. They, that's why they call them devils. And it's it can be a scary sound when you hear them at night. And whilst their numbers are reducing, they are certainly in the area that we were in. All right, who else was in there? 
So to be honest, I, I can't remember if there was anyone else in there. There, there must have been. Uh, but because I only saw it a couple of nights ago and I didn't have the ability to take any notes, uh, I can't remember who they were. So I'll cover their stuff in, in the next one. So yeah, overall, I thought it was really, really good to see. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, episode two in uh, shortly. Thanks for watching.